we wanted to have this follow-on session to um, the webinar that we had on February 10th reviewing uh, story maps. Uh, we covered a numerous material uh, back on that day. However, unfortunately, I had shut out a few people, and hopefully I didn't do the same thing here. We've got 36 folks out there now. We had 54 registered, so we'll see if uh, others come on or not. But uh, we wanted to take the opportunity to, to do a follow-up to uh, review some of the material that we had from before and just uh, share a couple more examples and then sort of mostly have an open session for anybody that has questions. We've got uh, Rupert Essinger from ESRI from their story map team has joined us as well and he's a great technical resource to uh, ask those questions to later on in the uh, hour or so. So uh, again it's kinda we wanted to make sure people know what's out there. We have a a Google site out there shared to all hopefully where we posted the recording from February 10th and you should all be able to see that hopefully uh, some of you watch that and were able to review it and we've got the agenda material a number of links um, and we've got a frequently asked questions document there that might be a way to you know to ask our questions and pu put them there to share until we have a, a larger forum to post some of these uh, items in. Um, and so really that's the gist of it. Is, is we can review um, as you wish uh, some of the material that we covered on the 10th. But if not, we probably would just move into the uh, showing a couple examples of, of some of the growth that we've had since February 10th. Uh, some of the newer story maps out there. Um, I know uh, Nicole Nicole McGavick from uh, WFO Tulsa has put together a nice story map reviewing a flooding event uh, back in December of last year. Uh, and Anna up at uh, WFO Jackson in the southern region has also put together a story map. And I'm not sure if Anna's on the call today, but I thought we would take a little bit of time to at least show those and uh, allow, allow those two creators to make any comments they wanted to share with the group. So, Nicole, are you out there? Do you mind if I, well, before I move to Nicole, Jamie, do you have anything else you want to add in terms of how we would move forward here on today's call? Um, no, I think it would be good to show some of the samples and then have the um, creators um, go through, you know, any stumbling blocks or in, any issues that they had that they might have had to overcome. Because I think um, any issues that they might have had, other people, as you're putting together, you might have those same stumbling blocks. So it would be nice to hear how they resolved it so that we can all learn together. Um, and then once they share theirs, uh, we have a couple other things that we'll show, um, one of which is there's an option in Story Map to do, to do a swipe map where you can compare two web maps. Um, but we had, um, I think it was, if I believe right, it was Nicole, as she was putting hers together, she was asking, is there a way to compare two images? So again, the story map, the app that Esri has, it compares two web maps. So she wanted two images. She wanted to pull an image from a web page and another image from a web page and compare those. And so there, there are some utilities, um, like third-party utilities that are out there that we'll show you a sample today of one of those where you can actually do a little swipe of uh, images, and then you can embed that into your story map. Um, but I, as Jeff mentioned, since our last webinar, there's been a lot of new ArcGIS online users and some new story map users, and it's really, it's really encouraging to see that. And I'm really excited to see how people are, are putting them to use. And I, I just really think there's a, a big place in the weather service for these. So it, it, it's just been exciting for me and Jack to see this, um, this new growth. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's wonderful. And again, these, these story maps are so flexible, they can be used for almost any topic. It's a great compliment to how we're doing Graphicasts and sharing Google site pages. A lot of this could be expanded into story maps. So, so Nicole, I've given you the control there. If you wouldn't mind going ahead and showing what you created and give us your experience. Okay, sure. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, well, first I was just going to briefly talk about um, the, the base web map. Um, what we did is uh, we had major and record flooding at the end of December, and so we went on a flood survey 
um, of several of our forecast points. You'll have to excuse me, I have a bit of a cold here, so I hope you can understand me, okay? <clears throat> but um, we took our office iPad with us and took lots and lots of pictures throughout the, the damaged area, and that afforded us um, having a geolocated tagged pictures through our, um, our survey. And so I just took notes as we went <clears throat> about where we were and um, came back. I had tons and tons of pictures. And so um, I know from the previous webinars, you know, you can go in and add pictures individually one by one. That was going to take me forever. Uh, so we wanted to figure out a way to get all those points plotted into a, a way that we can then import it into the web map. Um, so uh, when we, if you go to add um, a layer from a file, you have the choice of doing a zip shape file or um, a, a comma delimited file, or I guess there's some other options there. Um, so we decided to use um, an application that we found online called EXIF Extractor. And you put all the pictures that you want into a folder, and you give it a name and where you want it to go, and then you can choose what kind of data from your pictures you want to um, include in the CSV file. Um, and then you just hit Extract, and it'll, it'll bring up um, everything into a, um, an Excel spreadsheet as a CSV. And then I just added a couple of, there's a, you can, in the extractor, you can add a comment column, and this would show up as blank. Um, and then I added these two other columns, point, plot image and plot point, just for my own reference. Um, so I could look at the, all of the pictures that I, that I took on the survey, and I wasn't going to be able to use every single one of those. Um, and so this is my way of going through. I went through every picture and kind of gave it some notes as to pretty much the, the caption of the picture and whether or not I wanted it to display on our, our story map. Um, and then I also added a URL and a thumbnail URL, which you'll need later on when you do a story map. Um, so after I figured out, okay, which ones I wanted to actually plot on my story map, I made a, a, sep a separate um, page in Excel and put that information in here and then change the headers a little bit to be more compliant um, and fit with what the story map is going to be looking for in the CSV. So they'll be looking for a pick URL, a thumb URL, um, and um, so there's two different ways you can um, you'll be able to use this um, spreadsheet. So the one way is to actually put it into the story map, which I'll show you in a little bit, and the other way is for producing the web map. So once we had the file how we wanted it, we were able to import it here into our, our web map. Also using the iPad, I was, it gives you a GPS direction. So I um, used my legend to use what direction I was facing. Uh, and that was kind of nice because then you can, you know, that's just extra added information. Um, and then you can customize the uh, pop-up to display the information you want. So you, even though I have all those other columns that are in the spreadsheet, you can show all of that information, or you can just limit it to what you know might be pertinent for someone to look at. Um, so that's that's what I did here. So anyway, I just wanted to briefly mention that our next step is to see if there's going to be an easy way to do a, a zip shape file or um, KMZ or something to see if that will speed up the process. Um, I've also heard that maybe there will be a way from the DAT we can do um, non-wind damage um, surveys using the, the DAT and perhaps output from that will be easily um, transported into um, this interface too. So um, let's see. So here is um, the web uh, the story map that I made. I actually did a story map of just the one surveyed area, and I'm going to do one for the other forecast points that we did as well. And then um, I also made a story journal, and I embedded the story map into the story journal. So I think I hope I'm using the right words. I'm still new to this. So you embedded your map tour into the, the map, map tour. Journal. That's it. The map okay. tour into the um, map journal. Thank you. <laughs> um, so. Starting off, I guess I'll just kind of scroll through and show you what I did. Um, the first little home section is um, just a kind of a summary overview. And then I decided to break it up into kind of the weather summary 
um, one of our forecasters made a, a GIF animated image of the of the rainfall since it was over a two day two and a half day period um, and made a loop for me. But there, it's really quite simple to um, you know add content to these. Um, you can if there's certain web pages or links, you know you can click on that and it would pop it up here in the on the on the right panel. Um, very simple to do to add images and text. Um, so I found that to be quite easy. Um, and then I did a rainfall summary and included different information. And it's kind of nice that you can embed these links because you know not everyone's going to know what the Tulsa area responsibility is. So it's nice to be able to have these links for reference um, for anyone who's looking at these um, story maps or story journals. Then I went into um, the river flood summary. And this is where I started off with the um, web map that I had showed just a little bit ago with our survey plot. And, and again, there's going to be a, several surveys that will show up on here once I get those all completed. Um, and I kind of give an overview of the entire flooding story. Um, and you can even, when I was talking about the different uh, uh, reservoirs, I was able to, you know, if, I, if you click on the, the name of the reservoir, it will take you there on the map on the, on the right. So that was kind of nice to be able to do that. And then same thing with, um, I, I went and put all of the major and record floods, I put little images of the hydrograph. But when I talked about the basin, you could go and zoom to that basin. And then when I talked about the individual forecast points, um, I linked it to the web page, the AHAPS web page for that, so you could get more information about those particular points. Um, and then <clears throat> went into, keep going, they're kind of long, it's a lot of information. I went specifically into the Illinois River Survey. So this is the one that I had completed. And so here on the right is actually the um, <coughs> sorry, map tour um, that I had put together. And so this um, is, is a separate um, uh, app, that I guess, that you have to create. So first I made the web map of the of the uh, of the um, basin tour, then I made the um, the the tour, the story tour, um, as a separate application, and that's this Illinois River flood um, damage visit. And then after I finished that, then I built the journal and included uh, a link to that other website with the map tour inside of it. So. Um, you kind of have to think through, I, I figured out it was a little easier to kind of think through ahead of time kind of how I wanted to lay out the map journal and figure out what pieces I needed, get those pieces together, um, and, and then it made it a lot easier and faster to make the journal. That was how it worked well for me. It may work better for, you know, a different way for someone else. But So now I'll focus a little bit on the right here. Um, this, too, was pretty easy to, um, to put together. We pulled in that CSV file, and so I didn't have to add every individual point because there's 99 images here, and that's the most it'll hold. Um, but it made it quick and easy to put in. You can edit, I mean, not in edit mode, but you can um, edit very easily after you've even put in that CSV file. Um, I haven't figured out how to access that file directly, but you can actually just click inside the interface and change your caption, change the name of the image, um, change the URL where it's found. Um, same for the thumbnail. So I found it to be quite easy. Um, you could also move the point around. So say you were standing where you took the picture, but um, the actual damage point was out in the field. You know, you could move your point a little bit if you really wanted to be exact on where um, the picture has been taken. But it was nice. You could figure out. You could set the zoom levels and and um, all of that. So it worked out really well um, for telling the story. Um, and then I included other images from the event um, that since I, I maxed out my, my uh, map tour, I put some of the other extra um, images I had that told the story here on the, on the left-hand side. Um, and then I will, um, oh, and then I, we had a, a major and record flood on that same basin in 2011. And so I thought a lot of people would be interested in um, seeing how they compare. 
So I put in um, on the right our previous um, event web page and happened to take a picture in the same spot, amazingly. Um, and so I was able to make a picture of that and include that in here. And then I wanted to show the difference between the 2011 hydrograph and the 2015 hydrograph. So this is that swipe um, that um, Zach and Jamie mentioned earlier. Uh, the juxtapose, juxtapose website, and it gives you, uh, you can put in two URLs, and then you have some options on how you want to do the swiping of it. And so um, even though the, the pages don't line up exactly because of the, the scaling, I still thought it was a pretty cool way to um, be able to see the difference in um, the two events since we happen to have similar images for them. Um, and then uh, I have space here for my other two surveys once I get them done. And then finally, um, the Corps of Engineers, Tulsa District, had some really cool um, videos of um, some of the floodings and releases out of their projects. And um, so I wanted to include those. Uh, even though they weren't our property necessarily, I thought they helped to tell a story as well and obviously give the um, core credit here. Um, one thing I, I did use was Facebook video. And it worked fine for the first day. And then I came back the next day and was looking through it. And I got this URL signature expired. Um, and so Facebook video, I guess, must not be the best thing to use. Um, so this has been kind of a roadblock. I've sent an email to the, um, the public information officer over there and asked him if perhaps he could um, upload these specific videos to their YouTube channel because it seems like it's very easy. And, and Jamie even said that it's, it's really easy to, um, and more stable, I guess, to link to a YouTube video. Um, so in the meantime, uh, I, I just did this. Uh, at the end of last week, so I haven't had a chance to hear back from them yet. But I'm hoping to make that change, and so you people can still see the really cool videos. They would pop up on the right and um, and play. Um, I guess it, it went pretty smoothly um, for the most part. It's not too clunky to uh, you know make changes or edits. Um, sometimes I've noticed that if you want to make a, a change to um, like an image, if you go back to look at the URL that you used, um, it's disappeared. It's not still there. And so you, if you wanted to see oh, which image you know, number did I use on this one, it's, it's gone. You have to be like, um, I had to go find it again. Um, or if you just want to copy this and paste it and just make a small tweak to the URL. Um, so that's a, that's a little bit kind of annoying, I guess. Um, but Otherwise, the interface is pretty easy. If you do the swipe image, you have to use this button and look at the source code and um, put the, the frame information, the, the coding information that you get off of the Juxtapose website in it through coding the HTML view of it. Um, and to use the mainstays actions, I figured out you had to just highlight whatever it is that you want, and then you're able to um, make something happen over here on the right-hand side. So that's what that main stage actions was. And I think Jamie went over that already. Um, I think other than that, it was just once you kind of got it figured out, once you played with it for a little bit, it kind of it was pretty intuitive on how to, to do most of it. So I guess that's all I have. Well, Nicole, this is Jamie. Um, uh -huh. So I'm glad you, you, you covered a lot. I'm, I'm really glad you covered a lot of that stuff. Um, you had mentioned that it got to be pretty intuitive once you got into it. So, it, um, and that was one of the things I was trying to mention on our last webinar was that you know it's really pretty simple, and uh, once you get into it, it's I mean it's really it's self kind of self-explanatory, and you you can catch you can catch on to it really easily. Um, but I also wanted to ask you a question about how long because that was one of, the, one of the questions that people ask me the most is how long does it take to put these together? So, how long did it take you to put your map tour together, and then how long did it take you to put your, your journal together? Um, the map tour probably, well, what, the longest thing was just getting all the picture, the picture file ready to go. That, made, that took me forever just to go through all my pictures and catch them and figure out what I wanted and um, get those ready. But once I had that done, um, actually making the tour probably, oh, I don't know, like 
I was a couple of hours. I mean, it was pretty. Uh, it, it's taken away just learning the interface. It might have taken me a little bit longer just because I was, you know, trying to figure out what I can change and stuff. But for the most part, um, once I had the pictures where I wanted, I would say just probably a couple of hours, maybe three, to get it all in there and figure out how to, you know, make a little, a few extra edits I needed to make and 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 such. So that one went really fast. Um, and then the the journal took me longer just because I wanted to add so much stuff to it. Um, but um, I mean, I worked on it a little bit for you know a few hours, maybe for over several days. So um, I mean, it took me a while just because I kept wanting to include more and more and more. I, you could keep it fairly simple and you know get it done, and I would think a few hours also especially once you kind of figured it out. Once, after, you know, the first couple hours, you're just like, um, and you kind of fumble through it. And after you get one section done, you're like, oh, okay, this makes sense. And then things really pick up a lot faster. So I guess it just depends on how much content you want to include, how many sections, how many things do you want to link to, just going to the time it takes to go find those images or create any images you might want, find the web URLs that you want to display things. You know, that's kind of the most time-consuming part of it, I would say. All right, so, um, like, one of the things I had mentioned um, a couple weeks ago was I did a map tour for a post-tornado event, and I had mentioned it. You know, once, once you get the hang of it, they go together fairly quickly. And then once you have all your images in there, it's, you know, you can get them together pretty quickly. And I said, you know, I, I did that tornado one in just a matter of a couple hours. And so, so you've... Um, your experience was about the same. Once you got the hang of it, you had all your images in the right place, that map tour that we could use for post-storm um, surveys, it goes together really quickly. And you could turn those around um, almost, depending on what time of the day the event was, almost the same day or even the next day to get them up on your web page or social media. Yeah, I agree. And we, we thought that this would be a great way to, to do our survey. So we're trying to figure out a way how do we want to proceed as we go into the spring and, and our, into our tornado season. And um, But like I said, the, the biggest part, the hardest part, I guess, is just getting those images that you want to use and have those ready to go and importing those in. That's kind of the most time consuming part. And so we're trying to figure out a way to streamline that so that we can tell all of our forecasters, you know, hey, this is how, this is the steps you take to get your images ready, and then it's pretty straightforward once you do that. Thanks, Nicole. Hi, Nicole. This is Rupert. This is Rupert Essinga from ESRI. Yes. Well, it's a great demo. It's really it's really useful for us to see how you use this. I'm very impressed. I've got um, the the disappearing URL thing you mentioned is definitely an issue. So annoying. We're going to fix that, but not. We're actually making an update of ArcGIS Online tonight, but it's not in that fix. So it's going to be in a, in a release later this year, unfortunately. But I know what you mean with that URL not appearing. Yes. Well, I'm glad That's to a, hear that it's going to be fixed because yeah. that was driving me crazy there for a while. <laughs> Just one tip um, for your. For your embedded map tool, could you go to the section in this story map journal where you're where you're embedding the map tool? And this is just a tip. You don't you don't need to do this, but but if you you see how the top of the map tool has got a header that's got the the title and the subtitle. Yes. If you want to, you can you can um, omit that when you embed a map tool. Because you might very well have the description of that tool already in the text on the left. Yeah. So if you inc there's a parameter you can include after the URL of your map tool that's just ampersand embed. And if you do that, it will hide that header and therefore give you a little bit more space for your embedded map tool to appear. That's a great tip. Yeah, because it's, it's up to you, but but it might. It, it can unclutter things a little bit because, like I say, you might have the title and a description already in the over on the left there. Yes. No. Thank you. That's good to know. We want to. Uh, yeah. I want to keep it because it, someone might want to look at it just on its own, the, the map tool sure, by yeah. itself. But having it embedded, yeah. if you can remove that just for when it's embedded, that's that would be great. Because yeah, it's just redundant yeah. information. Also, <laughs> on the on the map in your map tool. 
I notice when you zoom in, it doesn't have um, road names on it. And that, again, that's up to you. But by default, when you're currently using the imagery with labels base map in ArcGIS Online, and actually by default, that's got place names and boundaries, but it doesn't have roads and street names. So just a tip in case you, you wanted to have roads and road names and street names on it, on any map, not just a story map, but on any ArcGIS Online map. If you use the imagery with labels base map, which is what you're currently using, you don't get street names. But okay. there's, a, there's a layer in ArcGIS Online that's freely available to anyone called World Transportation. And you can add that into the web map that, you, you, that you're using in your map tool or into any web map you, you create in ArcGIS. And it will give you um, street street names. Oh, perfect! I will add also that. draw draw road lines too. Okay. In order to add that layer into this, in the um, in the story map tool app builder, it doesn't let you add a layer into that web map. But mm -hmm. what you do is you'd go to my content in ArcGIS Online. You'd open up the web map that's used in your map tool and you'd add world transportation into that. So um, I should go to, yeah, if you want to do it now, go to add and say search for layers. And if you type in world transportation, and you, you change the in drop down to be all of ArcGIS Online. Oh, I didn't spell it right, did I? No pressure. On. <laughs> <laughs> ah. There we go. And then you click click add on that. Now it's going to look weird because the web map we're looking at isn't using imagery. The imagery with labeled space map. But if you if you were to change the space map to be imagery with labels, because I guess in your story map tour, you overrode the base map inside the tour. But if you just set this one, you'll see, you'll see the effect. And you may or may not like it. It gives you lots of roads. But it might, be good for, it might be good for orientation, especially for flood events. And if you zoom in on an urban area, you'll get street labels. I see. And the, the road lines actually disappear as, as you zoom in really closely. The road, line, the road lines will disappear, and you just get the label for the road. I see. Anyway, I just thought I'd mention that, because it, because, um, it's not obvious. And we really, ESRI really needs to improve how that's exposed, because there's a lot of maps we see without street lab labels. I, I thought see, I'd yeah. mention that to you. So when you do that, so uh, that would improve the, the story, um, the store, or the map tour, I'm sorry. Um, yes. So once you Will refresh that your then map, change story this map, map as well? It would show up on here. Can this be overridden within the story journal to just be this? Because it may be too much then with the imagery. I'm afraid that the little dots wouldn't show up as well. Oh, or yeah, they yeah. almost the same. So if you're, using, if you're using the same web map in your map tool and your story map journal, and you want them to appear differently, you, you can do that. What you do is, you'd, in, the, in the map journal builder, when you define a section and say which web map you want to appear, in, in the, um, there's an option in the edit control to choose which layers get displayed. Would that be under the content? So, yes, custom configuration. So for example, if you, it, depends how you, it depends how you want to set it up, but that option lets you it lets you put a web map inside a map journal and then say which layers in that web map you want to display. And it's a really useful function because it enables you to make quite a complex story map and just use one web map. But, but then each section in your map journal can display different layers in that map. And in fact, it's, it's a good performance tip too because it's much faster for the story map app to load a single web map than to load multiple ones. But again, okay. it's up to you how you want to do that. OK, thank you. So, so
So, for example, you could add your imagery layer. Instead of making it a base map, you could add it as a layer and just turn it on or off. I see. But anyway, have, have a play around with that. I thought I'd mention that because it, it can be quite, quite useful. Yes, no, I think that would definitely be a good thing to know. Thank you. That's wonderful, Nicole. Any, any other questions? Thank you, Rubric, for those those tips. I, I, I was thinking that the ArcGIS, uh, the online, uh, sorry, ArcGIS Online Assistant might be one way to get around that uh, inability to see that link that uh, that must be inside of the the JSON if someone wanted to change that. But. Yeah, this system this system wouldn't give you access to that via its UI, um, but I can't wait to fix that because because I come across that too. Okay. So I'm going to be talking to my developer. Nicole, one question I had for you was your your CSV file. You have to you do put that on the web somewhere. Did that was that easy to do? Are, are you on the new what the CMS stuff for your web page? Um, no, we're not on the new one yet, and actually I still have to put it up on our X drive. I guess that's not totally, I don't think I've done that yet. I meant to. Oops, sorry. <laughs> so you just I thought I had it up. You say that. I don't know that I actually, because I made some changes. I was like, oh, I'm going to wait until I finish making these changes before I pop, populate it. Um, so I need to do that. So you just loaded it up from your local machine to put it in the, in the map? That's what I've been doing, yeah, just loading it up. Okay. Our, we call it the X drive, but whatever it is that syncs down to region. One of the other questions I had was maybe for Rupert. When you, I know, like in this case, when you have a map on the right and you want to, sometimes I want to jump out of the the journal and just look at that embedded map. Of course, you can put the link on the left side to that web map. But is there an option coming, or am I missing something where you would be able to open that into a new tab and? Explore just that map. No, we have, yeah, we've not got that as a separate option. So, but you would you could author that as a as a link in your text. Okay. It's really hard to go with the pick of the. Oh, that. Anybody else have any questions for Nicole? You your name to a group, so, somebody could mute. That would be appreciated. Anna, are you out there? And would you want to show your story map at all, or anything to add from WFO Jackson? Okay. I guess maybe Anna's not on. Or can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Sorry, I was. It took a little bit to unmute. Um, but I can show my, my story map. I don't have as much to say as uh, Nicole does. Okay, that's fine. That's, I thought it would be a chance to you know, show what you created and whatever maybe slight differences you have. Sure, yeah. Let me go ahead and give you control. Thank you, Nicole, for that, that very descriptive walkthrough. Sure, no problem. All right. Can everybody see it? Yep. All right. Um, so we've had a very busy February in my office. Um, seems like every week we've had another round of uh, severe storms, tornadoes. Um, and I've kind of played around with uh, story maps before, and uh, I, I listened in on the last webinar and decided to give uh, this story map another go um, after uh, this uh, round of severe storms that we had in the middle of February. Um, and it, it did not take me long to do because I played around with it before and kind of figured it out um, and how it all works and everything. Um, in all, it probably took me, you know, three hours to do. Um, I got all of our data off of the, the DAT software that we used for our storm surveys. Um, and then I just pulled off all the other information from what we had, our, what we had already put on our website. Um, 
after the, the damage survey. So um, it was really easy to do. Um, and Jack, you gave me a lot of tips uh, afterwards on how to improve it a little bit. Um, and still, I'd like to put a few more improvements on there, but we've been so busy that I haven't had time to do any of that. Um, so I, it's a really simple map. It's just a, one of those map journals. Um, and I put our event summary up here. Um, and you know you can scroll down here, and it'll take you to each tornado uh, that we had. Um, all of the information that was in the LSR, uh, I copied and pasted that from our website and then added the summary. Um, we have uh, the, the radar imagery, and you can uh, expand that and make it bigger uh, to really see where the tornado was at. And then um, uh, I wanted to be able to put the pictures uh, from the tornado uh, in the pop-up, and Jamie gave me uh, some tips on how to do that. I just haven't had the chance to do it yet. Um, but on some of these, I have included some pictures um, down below the summaries uh, along with the radar image. Um, I also added, we were really lucky, and we had this guy offer to do uh, a drone uh, sur a survey and take some drone footage for us. So I added that in here, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and I'll just play that real quick. Um, it was really easy. I just added in a video. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Um, he offered to do it for free to for us and give us all the data. And we jumped on that. Uh, and this was the worst point um, of this tornado. Um, this was the worst damage uh, from it. So uh, I definitely wanted to add that in here. Um, this was the worst tornado of the day. Um, so anyway, I mean, we had, I think, a total of seven tornadoes in our area. And that's just what all of this is. Uh, it takes you through each one here. Um, and then down here at the end, we have a rainfall summary um, and uh, the storm reports, uh, the big summary of the storm report. So um, like I said, I've played around with this a little bit. Um, so I kind of knew how to do it, and it didn't take me that long at all. Um, so and I don't have any GIS background. I got the same problem. My monitor level died in the middle of a conference call. My monitor died in the Jan, middle. can you mute? Sorry. <laughs> um, so um, I would like to do this for all of our other uh, storm surveys. It's really easy to do. And I, I think it's a much prettier output than what we can put on our website. Um, and that's why I like to do these. That's great, Anna. Hey, one question I had was when you said you pulled from the DAT, is it so it's not pointing to the DAT, it's you actually did like an extract? I did, yes. Okay. Is it is it possible to point to it or is that not possible? Do you get a benefit? I don't by... know. I don't know. I mean I'm just a beginner, I don't know. Um, this is this is how I figured it out. Okay. And it's an extract to a shape files, or it's not KMZ, or is it? Yes. Yes, it's an extract to a shape file. Okay. I, I made another um, map, and I that's what this whole background is um, on this map on the right. Okay. I have uh, you know this other web map, and that's what that background is. Great. Thanks for the walkthrough. Any Anna, questions? Yeah, this is Jamie. I just wanted to, um, I think Anna made a really good point. Um, she said she's not a GIS person, so I just wanted to point that out. I mean, these story maps can be put together by other folks within our office, and, it, and you don't necessarily have to be a GIS 
expert or have GIS training to put these together. They're, they're really uh, pretty intuitive and pretty simple to do. So I thought that was a really good point that you said that you're not a GIS person, but you're able to do this. Yes, absolutely. Jamie, do you want me to pass you to controls next if we have no more questions and you can show a swipe thing real quick or? Um, sure, or we could just do it. I mean, you do have control. We can, you can just open it up and I can talk. Okay. Thank you, Anna. Yes, you're welcome. Um, Mike was using the code job in. Trying to get control back here. Okay, so you're going to go back to your agenda page? Yeah. Okay. You want me to show this URL, okay, so, right, Jamie? Yeah. So one, one of the questions that Nicole had as she was putting it together, she showed what she did with that, being able to swipe images. Um, with the Esri Map Tour, you can, within the, the Map Tour app, you can do a swipe, or well, actually, it's, it's the Swipe app. So within a Story Map Swipe app, you can, it's really easy to swipe two different web maps that you have. But the, um, Nicole wanted to do images, so um, we found out about, you know, and this is probably not the only tool that's out there, but it was the one that we tried. We found out about this um, juxtapost page. Uh, it's, just, it's a web page. You go to their, to their juxtapose.nightlab.com, and it's super simple to go into this web page and take the URL from one image and the URL from another image, and you just you paste those in into the web page here, and then you say update preview, and and it gives you this nice little swipe of two different images, and then you can take, as Nicole showed, you can take the 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 code from this. It'll, if you, when you, once you hit that publish button, it'll populate that box right there and you grab that code and you use that to put into your story map. And so she showed a really nice example of how she embedded that in there and was doing a swipe feature of two different images. So we just wanted to bring that up um, in case other people were thinking about that, wanted to do it, um, and didn't know how to do it if you wanted to compare images. So it was just a, it was really neat to do. And Jack, I think he's showing one right now, one that he put together where he compared two different images as well. And when you use this feature, this web page, you can choose to have the swipe be vertical or horizontal. So it gives you a little bit of um, options there. Um, yeah, I think but that's, 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 yeah, I think it's helpful go, since ahead. we have so much of our stuff just in image format, unfortunately, and not GIS services, it, it's helpful to be able to to do a swipe on the images, even though it's not maybe the best way to do things. So we appreciate Rupert. He was the one that pointed us onto that link as, an, as a possibility for looking at two different images. Yeah, the, the only other thing I wanted to show on the agenda was um, the Esri uh, Story Map blogs. Esri, uh, the Story Map team does, uh, they have a blog site where they'll put different information and different topics about Story Map. And um, Anna was showing that on her story map, she wanted to embed some images. In, um, in, in, on her web map, she has the points on the map, and she wanted to be able to click on that point, and then in the pop-up, embed some images in there, and then be able to pop those out. Um, as we have it, within that blogs, in their blogs that they have on the, about story maps, they actually have a blog just about how to do that, how to add um, pop-ups in your displays. So I shared that with Anna, and, I, and she's going to give it a try. But I just wanted to point out, there's a, Esri has this really nice resource for um, information that they already have put together. But it's real simple. It just walks you through on you know, how, to, how to add those, those pop-up images in there. Uh, one so that, that link's on the agenda. Yeah, that link's on the agenda, yep. Thank you, Jamie. 
Rupert, if you're still out there, it was one of the questions I had about these pop-ups. And it, maybe it's not doable, but one of the things I always want to do is, uh, is there any way to do some simple math <laughs> using one of the values? Since if one of my attributes is a number, could I subtract 10 from all my numbers or something like that? Or maybe do a quick conversion to a different unit? It doesn't support that as far as I know. In the, um, in the, so you, all the pop-ups are configured in the web map itself. So that's not part of authoring the story map. That's the standard web map configuration. And like this, like this blog post that's currently on screen showing you, this is the, this is the custom attribute display box. This is where you define what, how you want your pop-up to appear if you want to customize it. Yeah, it doesn't let you do calculations. I know exactly what, what you mean, though. But it doesn't support that. It lets you include text in different okay. ways. And um, it lets you include a URL, for example, to a place. But yeah, it doesn't have calculations there. OK. I just thought somewhere I had maybe seen somebody do that, but it might not have been in a web map that, that you could sort of you know, put like a divide by 10 or something with your field. But maybe that was in a yeah. different area. Thank you for that. Uh, that kind of wraps up the material that, that we were thinking of showing in terms of, you know, otherwise other than opening up and seeing what other people wanted to see or ask questions. Anybody on the on the line? Hey, Jack, this is Jan. Sorry for the interruption before, but my computer died in the middle. Oh, no but I, And so I can't see anything. But I have a question. Has anybody done groups so that you added somebody to a group because you were co-working on a map? I, I don't know. I haven't done that yet. I know we've been thinking about how to grow into that area to, to share and co-create. Is that what you're talking about, I having created, like two editors? Or? Yeah, I, I created a group, and I added someone to it, and they could, they could view it and stuff, but they couldn't edit it. And part of the rationale for wanting this is that if you go into to, um, a map and then into a – so I was doing a story map. And you can customize the attributes of what attributes you want to show. And so you can completely customize the pop-up window. So you can stick the image on the top of the pop-up window. And then, but in that pop-up editor part, you can actually do CSS styling. And so I was thinking I'd let the web designer design that pop-up using the CSS because she could have more control. And I couldn't figure out how to get the pop-up editor part to work because I'm not the editor, but to share it as a group so she could do it. I guess Randy sent me email, and on the email he sent, there was a place to click that the user could actually um, add, add content. And I can't find that on mine. Yeah, that's deeper than I've gone, Jan. Sorry, I can't offer any help. Anybody else? Oh well, it was a thought. Yeah, I could see folks wanting to do that. That's that would be. Yeah. There's a couple of um, there's a couple of blog posts about collaborating on maps and apps, and I could perhaps send those to to Jamie. Okay, and then they could just forward it to the people that attended. Yeah. One of the things also with story maps that that um, it's, not, it's often not immediately obvious is that you don't have to be the owner of the map that's used in a story map. So we've set it up, and that's actually true of all the apps in ArcGIS Online, is that one of the aims was that the actual web maps might be made by different people or even a different department or different agency, and those could still be used in a story map. So you don't have to be the, the owner of the map. You're not expected to do all the all the mapping work in order to use a map in a, in a story map. But um, classically, most story maps will see the person making the story map also made the maps as well. But, but um, you don't have to be in terms of authoring these. I think you yeah, can solve the, the problem, I, Rupert, in that I had done this, and it's not public yet because I'm in the process of trying to create the map first and then make it public. But it may be that once I make, if I make it public, then she could then incorporate it and do everything.
Yeah, you this can is still Jamie on my on the February tenth webinar we did. One of the web apps I showed at when I was doing my samples, um, when I was going through my presentation, uh, I did do exactly what Rupert was saying. I used other people's web maps in into my um, app, um, but they did have to be shared publicly for me to um, be able to access them. I will give that a try then. Yeah, you can author a story map with maps that aren't aren't public, but if they're but you have to have access to them yourself. So if someone's made a map but they've kept it private, they've not shared it into your if you can't access it in standard ArcGIS online, you wouldn't be able to access it inside inside the story map authoring. I've made it more complicated because I have ArcGIS server. So I had it as a map with a um, a private map. So I log in and, and authenticate, and then I have access to the map. And the user can log in and have access to the the service too. Both I shouldn't say map to the service. And then we've incorporated that service within AGOL. Yeah. So you've got a you have a web map, and one of one or more of the layers in it is actually being served up from ArcGIS server. Exactly. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, any other questions or anything anybody wants to share? Rupert, I know we talked about this National Park Service uh, example. Which did you want to show anything there, or was there anything unique with that? I could do. Yeah. Do you want me to, want me to yes, I could do. I think it's an interesting example of because um, one thing that came to mind when you were showing in the two demos we saw today, one was of flooding and one was of tornado, and it seems like. I'm assuming in your business, that's that's sort of a, that might be like a that's something that you guys need to respond to rapidly when when people have had have had when those sort of things occur. It makes me wonder if there's perhaps if there's perhaps some scope for doing for having like you guys defining a a standard for what. A story map for a flood looks like, or what a story map for a tornado would look like. Not not in a strict way, but just to help folks create story maps when there's been an incident like that. There could be there could be like a, um, a best practice or a guideline for what what things to include in that story map. What sort of what sort of things do you have to collect, and how do they appear, so that you could to enable folks to make those sort of stories. More easily, without each one, without each one being a being a complete authoring task. So, when there is a flood, you want to create a story about. Um, depending on what what your requirements would be, there might be like a there could be like a little a little document that says here here are the sort of things to include, or here's how to present that. Yeah, I certainly think that uh, Nicole's CSV is probably close to. You know, one way to do it in terms of yeah. collecting your material, and then you know Anna's download from our DAT tool, which is you know, <coughs> their services, but downloading it as shapefiles. If if we saw th th that's pretty much a standard, I think, in terms of our attributes currently. So that might work yeah. for tornado damage. And we're very keen, like I've discussed with you before, on finding ways to help organizations to automate the production of these, so it's not such a manual or thing authoring process that the more we can automate these, especially for things like weather incident responses, the better. So we're, we're interested to see what sort of workflows or needs you you folks would have for that to to make these easier to make. We'd like to be able to we'd like we'd like people to be able to pour data and photos into these and generate products more easily. This is Nicole. I have a quick question. Um, and maybe this is for Anna, Anna too. Um, with the, uh, I know in hers, she has. It looks like a table that talks about like the attributes for the um, on on the left hand side of her journal um, that talks about the tornado, like what the EF scale was, length and strength and all that. Um, is can you input? Is that an image that she's had that you have there, Anna, or is that like did you were you able to make a table in there? And then 
you know, if you had that basic kind of, is there a way to make like a template, I guess, for each of those tornadoes? You know, because you know, a lot of times you're going to have multiple tornadoes, so you're going to have um, a section for each of them. You know, is there a way to have kind of a base template where you that you could just save off somewhere um, that you could <laughs> copy and paste, like a forecaster could quickly copy and paste that and then fill in that table um, for each of the tornadoes so that there's less, like you said, Rupert, less having to start from scratch for every tornado event to make it quicker and easier for whoever's on shift that day. Yeah, Anna might, that's have, a really good idea. Anna might have dropped off. I'm not sure. We're losing some folks, but I guess that's an image there, huh? Well, I'm still here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, it is an image. It's a it's a PNG. Um, I think it would be great to have a template uh, for storm surveys like this, and to put um, to put stuff like this together. Um, I'm still trying to figure out all the image uh, stuff for this and how to get them onto these story maps. Um, like I said, I'm a complete beginner. Um, so I, you know, I don't know a lot about computers to begin with, so I'm, I'm really just stumbling my way through this. But if we could have a template uh, for like storm surveys and story maps and put those together, I think that would be great. And it would help me personally out a lot uh, to do this stuff for our office. Yeah, I like Anna, how you set it, how you set it up, and we've used that table kind of look on our event web pages in the past, um, and it makes it real easy for people to see the information. But it also makes it easy um, for when if information has to change. A lot of times we'll have preliminary information that the survey team will tell us, and then we have to go back after they've come back to the office and look more closely. They might, you know, make a minor adjustment to that data. So having it as a table inside the story um, journal would be a better Actually, way than having to have it be an image, but I don't. I couldn't find a way to make a table, so that may just not be a feature well, that's available right now. Nicole, that's actually I copied and pasted it from our web page. Actually, oh okay, that's all I did. Um, so it probably has HTML code then, Rupert. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's not particularly easy to get tables in, but if you if you copy and paste them, they do work. If the if it's HTML format, but I've written this down because it, it, I can see that tabular information over on the left is an important is an important feature of these, and um, we should make sure it's easy to do that. And I also like the idea of being able to have a table that you can you can type into directly as an author. Yeah, I think that would be really helpful. I know I was looking to make a table for some of the data I had to make it just easier to read for for folks. So I might go back and explore doing it with the HTML because I know a little bit about that, um, coding that. So I might look into that part of it, but I hadn't had a chance to play yeah. around. But yeah, if you guys were able to make it an easy way to do that, that would be wonderful. I agree. So this, map, this map we're currently looking at on screen is another one that would benefit from having the world transportation layer added into it so you can see see the road names. Yes, I uh, I was listening during that, and I wrote a couple notes down, and I, I will go back oh. and do that because um, I was looking uh, for how to do that uh, for this map. Yeah, we've really because I love that. Yeah, because I love having the imagery on there because when you zoom in, you want to see what houses have been affected and stuff. Right. Um, but yeah, having the street names on there would also be really helpful. And you know that you can do that that addition inside the inside the story map journal builder directly. So you don't need to leave the builder to do that. In the in the story map okay. tool, um, you'd have to edit the web map by going back to my content. But in the story map builder, if you go to the edit dialog for a section and look mm -hmm. at where it says main stage map, there's an edit button there that lets you edit the map. Mm -hmm. And then you could do a search for world transportation and add that in. Okay. Okay. So. 
Yeah, tonight there's an update of ArcGIS Online with some new features. There's, there's a couple of things in um, story maps we're adding. We're adding the ability to, we're adding an auto claim mode so that when you, when you um, share, a web, share a story map, you, you could have it playing, you could have it advance automatically. And that's sort of useful for um, if you have a display monitor at a demo or a trade show or a visitor center or something like that or a, or a field office. You could have a story map running, running automatically and then you can, you can interrupt it and, and start using it manually. We're also adding, I don't know if you noticed during this demo, um, the, the people who are presenting story maps who were the owners of those story maps, there was a green button on their story map that said no issues. There was also a blue button that said edit. And in tonight's update of ArcGIS Online, you, if, you're the, if you're the owner of the store map, you'll be able to close those so they, they don't appear when you're giving a demo. I just thought I'd mention that. That's good to know, yeah. That's, so tonight, that, that one that lets you loop through it is going to be added. Yeah. Great. We're also improving how, yeah, that's the autoplay mode. We're also improving how story maps appear when they're shared on social media. So if you're creating story maps for public, for public consumption, um, it's, it's a good tip to um, have a look in either ArcGIS Online My Content or the My Stories section of the story map website. And make sure that you add a thumbnail for the entry in ArcGIS Online that, that represents your story map. Because that thumbnail will, will get used, will now get used more when someone shares your story map. So if someone finds your story map and they share it on Twitter, um, it will use that thumbnail that is that you can upload into the ArcGIS Online item, and it will also use the the title and the summary in that item as well. So it's definitely good, especially if it's something that you're going to be promoting or if you're responding to a, to a news event and want to get something out, just to make sure you um, go to my content and make, make the entry for your story map, the thumbnail and the title and the summary and the tags, make sure to fill those all out because that will give you a better result when someone shares that on social media. Great tip. Thank you. Well, we've uh, passed our hour. We probably ought to close out. Unless anybody yep. else wants to ask a couple of last questions. Uh, I, I have a, a question of clarification, uh, maybe for Nicole. She used the uh, EXIF extractor for her for her pictures, and I thought she said she wasn't able to maybe use that as an auto upload for the information into the story map. Is that is that correct? And if so, is there a way to, to be able to ingest that metadata information about the pictures into the story map? Uh, when I used the extractor, it created, I manually had to choose all the options and hit the extract button, and it, man, you know, it created a CSV, and then I um, manually input, <coughs> imported that into the um, the the story tour, the map tour, um, and also into the web map. So, I, if there's an automated way of doing it, uh, there might be. I just don't know what that is um, because I'm I, this is all new to me too. I'm not a GIS person either. So there may be um, someone who has more experience on how to do that a little faster um, to get stuff in there at a faster rate. That's how I did it. Yeah, when you when you create a story map tool, if you're using a CSV file or referencing your images just by a URL, you would need to go through those steps to get the um, the location geo geocode information in. Um, but built into the story map tool, it it does have the option, which I don't know if it would work for your work, but it does have the option to access um, photos that are in Flickr, Facebook, or Picasa slash Google Photos. It does, have, it does have options when you create a story map tool to get photos from those 
And in those cases, it, it does automatically pull that information over. So for example, if, you've, if you take a whole bunch of photos of a flood and put them, in, and, um, put them into a Flickr account, and in that, Flickr, in that Flickr account, you've got the option for geocode information to be shared publicly, because that's an option you actually, actually turn on in Flickr. And I think in Google Photos too. Um, but if you do that, um, when you create a story map tool, you can point it at that Flickr account without having to make a CSV file, and it will build a tour using those photos and their locations. Okay, thank you. I, I think that might be another area there where earlier Rupert mentioned uh, I think it's a great idea maybe to come up with a or work toward a an agency template for for flood survey story maps or or storm damage survey story maps, but you know as a, a best practice there with regard to how to handle pictures because that I can see that definitely being a, a critical piece. Yeah, sort of depends how you're assembling those photos. Like if you're if there's someone going out with a with a camera or a phone taking pictures and that they've got if they have the Flickr app on that phone, for example, it will it will automatically upload those into a Flickr account as you take the pictures. Then back in the office um, or someone else back in the office could access that Flickr account and create a story map tour from that. And they don't even have to be the owner of that account. You can type in anyone's you can type in anyone's Flickr username and it will give you those photos um, in the story map tour author environment. Okay, good idea. Thank you for that. The CSV workflow is there and it's also very useful for cases where you've got databases with all this information already in it. Like if you have um, you might have a, a web service someone's created that's storing photos taken in the field with an app like the ArcGIS Collector. Or you might have a database with URLs to photos and locations already there, um, or a spreadsheet. Then it, it will ingest those as well. Rupert, this is Nicole again. Um, is there a way um, after in the story tour, or the map tour, um, once you've you've pulled in your CSV file, is there a way to view that again and make edits to that, or do you just have to do everything individually, um, just through the editing, the little edit pencil buttons or whatever for each um, picture? Yeah, there's not there's not a, there's not a way to refresh from a, a CSV file while you're editing because when you import a CSV it will it brings it into the CSV so it brings it into the web map directly and stores okay. it there okay so you can't view that within the, the editing ed interface you could um, yeah, if you want to make changes to things you've uploaded via CSV in that workflow you'd have to make edits individually or okay. re-upload the whole thing but there are okay. workflows there are workflows you guys you guys could take advantage of in ArcGIS Online. For example, um, the, the story map tool, if you publish your web map as a story map tool, it will look in that web map and see if there's a, if there's a layer in there that contains tour um, records. And so you could automate some story map tool creation by, you could have a web map that has a layer in it that is a service that's being served, that, that is being edited, for example, in in ArcGIS for desktop, and those those changes would get reflected in the story map tool. If you go to the story map, if you upload a CSV file into a web map directly, then it just pulls that that set of data into the web map and stores it in the web map. So that's what happens when you upload a CSV or a shape file into a web map, or if you upload a CSV file into the story map tool authoring environment. But there are other more automated workflows. As long as, as, long as that web map contains a layer 
that's got points with the with the correct fields, like it has a photo URL and it has an X, Y. As long as it has that, you can generate that in a variety of ways that might help you automate that. For example, um, this might not be all that good for you, but you you can you can use um, Google Documents to make a, a Google spreadsheet that contains um, records that define a map tool. You can add that that um, a reference to that Google spreadsheet into a web map and then use that to publish a map tool. And then whenever anyone updates the information in, in the Google spreadsheet, it will update the map tool. So there's a few things perhaps for someone to explore for the most efficient ways to do that kind of assembly of places because there's a number of options we support. So Rupert, you don't lose anything whether you uh, upload it to the web map or whether you leave a CSV sitting on the web, both of them will drive the map the same way? Yeah, it all works the same way. Uploading a CSV into a web map directly is the easiest way, but it makes a, it, it just copies the data into there. It doesn't let you do updates easily. Right. You have to do manual updates for that. Okay. But, but if you have a database of photos or some way of storing those and then just spit them out and then put them in a web map, the, the map tool, when you put, the map tool will always look at the web map to see what, and and it will display the latest, the latest data in the web map in the map tool app. Yeah, I've been using online, you know, web-based CSV files that update, you know, hourly. So it, yeah. it seems to be working pretty well. Certainly for simple views, I assume it would work for this this case as well. Yeah. Any other questions before we close out? Thank you all for attending, and uh, we'll have a recording out here, assuming it worked, and share that into that Google Drive space, all right? Thank you all, and thank you for, for your input. Thanks for watching. Thanks, guys.